get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Michael Drew. This is session number two. He's founder of Promote a Book. He's one of the most successful book promoters on the planet with 84 consecutive books on the national bestseller list like New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and also has helped over 1,000 Amazon titles to number one. He's worked with authors such as Peter Diamandis, Marshall Goldsmith, T. Harvecker, and many more. Session one was so powerful, and we had so much more to dive into, so we're on session two. Michael, sure. thanks for joining me. Hey, th- Jeremy, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, the first time... We weren't so sure about the fun facts, but after the first, the second time, you know, we have some amazing ones, which you didn't mention, which is if people watch the the first session, Michael's a twin. He's one of eight kids and he's a former drug dealer, That's all right. of which in the beginning wasn't a fun fact to you, but to me it was. I actually, before we want to transition and we, where we left off when we talked a lot about publishing and some of the history behind how you got into publishing and some of the things on what people should look out for on getting to be a bestseller. Um, you had an interesting answer that leads us into the intimate behavior by Desmond Morris and 12 steps of intimacy, which we'll get into. But I want to ask a drug dealer question just out of curiosity. And sure. So what is a crazy story or something you learned from being a drug dealer, which I would not have expected you were going to say? <laughs> I, I don't know that I have any really crazy drug dealing um, experiences. Certainly when I was homeless on the street as part of being a drug dealer, saw fights and stabbings and shootings and those kinds of things, which are, I don't want to glorify at all. They're right. interesting, but not related to drug dealing. Right. Um, where was this? Where was it? Where were you at the time? Bellingham, Washington. Hmm. Washington State, up uh, the border between the U.S. between the U.S. and Canada. Um, but you know the thing about about drug dealing, like any other business, is it's a business. It literally is a business, and you have to figure out. You know, we talked about last time doing the research to figure out your market and all of that. Um, drug dealing has its market, and it has its way of peddling and selling and identifying customers, and all the same things that we do in business that we do in normal business. Um, it's more nefarious. It's not legal, but you know, the things that you've got to figure out how to do is how to manage your inventory. So who are you buying your inventory from? How are you cutting your inventory? How are you, um, how are you making it easier on your customers? Not only to get access to the supply, but do it in a way that's safe for them. Um, how are you creating legal security for your company in this case, making sure that the money and the drugs aren't in the same place so that you don't get the you know the, the the problems that go with that. Um, how do you hire employees? How do you identify what kind of employee makes the right kind of employee for what you're doing? <laughs> how do you train the employee? How do you help them do market identification and go out and and do their job of selling? Like, all of those things go into drug dealing as it would with any other business. Yeah. So one of the reasons I was successful was because I had a, a, a business mindset going into it to begin with, right? That's that. That's how I, I thought about it. If I'm going to be here and this is what I'm going to do, well, let's make sure we make a lot of money doing it. Let's make sure that we're successful. It's a large have, risk there, yeah. There's a large, yeah. There, 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 all business ha- have risk. In this case, the risk was a was a was a legal risk, right? So so we had to mitigate that that legal risk versus the reward, right? So you know, it, it was like any other business. Yeah. I thought you were going to tell me some sexy story where you, you know, were trapped in a building and the cops were outside or something like that. But um, no, no, I, I don't have a James Bond story. Okay. So, you know, Michael, we were talking about the 12 steps of intimacy. And before that, you came out with a book, Pendulum. And I want to know how did Pendulum come about and tell people a little bit about that. So 
my first best-selling author that we mentioned on the last call, his name is Roy H. Williams. He's known as the Wizard of Ads. And I actually watched your interview with uh, Jeffrey Eisenberg, and he talked about Roy as well. Yes, yeah. He talked about his first time being being asked by Roy to, to speak at the Wizard Academy. But um, I was there before there was a Wizard, Wizard Academy. Um, Ray Bard, my b- boss at Bard Press, came up with the Wizard of Ads uh, modality. And the Wizard Academy came out of a conversation with Ray Bard, Roy Williams, Penny Williams, and myself after we had released uh, Magical Worlds of the Wizard of Ads. And there was a question, how do we grow um, Roy's business? And I brought up my experience working at the uh, the Covey organization with the the events and things they did there. And so they were already doing live events, but the, the concept of the Wizard Academy was born out of that conversation. Mm-hmm. So uh, Roy and I have this long, long-term uh, relationship. He's kind of like a, a secondary father. He and Ray Bard are both like fathers to me. Yeah. Um, and we, um, he, Roy wanted to figure out how to give his clients competitive advantage. He owns the fourth largest ad agency in North America right. for Bike Radio. And he was talking to a friend of his um, who was a who was the is a professor of psychology at the University of Texas in Austin, uh, Dr. Nicholas Grant, um, back in 2003, and he said to Dr. Grant, he said, you know, 2003 feels an awful lot like 1963 all over again, only in reverse. And Nick Grant said, hey, yeah, it kind of is. Let me recommend some different books for you to read: Faith Popcorn. Um, uh, Strauss and Howe with Generations and a Fourth Turning and some other books. So Roy read that and was in directional agreement with with what he read, but he had uh, a precision or accuracy problem with that. Roy is a, a an evangelical Christian, and he knew that in the Bible there were over sixty mentions of forty year generational patterns. Hmm. There was there were other evidence in science of forty year patterns, and so he said eh, it can't be. For 20-year generational patterns, it has to be or 20-year patterns has to be two 40-year patterns. And so, what Roy and I did is we went back and researched the last 3,000 years of recorded Western civilization, both empirically um, uh, looking for empirical uh, empirical data as well as empirical data as as well. And what we found was that um, human beings are not unique snowflakes; that we indeed followed the same patterns over and over and over and over again right that in fact there is there is a pattern what we found was that there that to Roy's hypothesis that there are in fact two 40 year generational patterns a pattern of me about the individual and a pattern of we about community or society as a whole mm-hmm. now when you get deep into one of these cycles it's easy to demonize the other cycle there's a beauty in a me it's about freedom and self-expression. Mm-hmm. But what happens is a human in human psychology, this is what pendulum theory looks at, is the psychological patterns of how society changes its modality from one ideology to another, which is a psychological pattern. What happens is we always take a good thing too far. So when we take me too far, we move from the beauty of freedom and self-expression and being an individual to becoming plastic and phony and a society of posers. Right. Right, and it's the youth of society that reject that overexpression of me mm-hmm. and pulls us mm. from a me cycle into a we cycle. I see. Yeah. Now there's a beauty in a we cycle, and in a we cycle, it's about community. It's about um, doing what's best for c- society as a whole, a be- which is a beautiful thing. Yeah. The problem is when we take we too far, we lose our sense of, of individuality. We lose. Um, the ability to have clear self-expression as an individual because it has to it, it's accepted from a group standpoint we become a society that becomes highly regimented and highly conformed and again the youth of society reject this extreme nature this overreaction and they then pull us as a culture and society back to a me cycle so we have this consistent back and forth pull uh, that is uh, uh, propagated by the youth of society as we take one of the two ideologies mm. too far. Yeah, yeah. And we, we, when we did the research, we were expecting it to this this to be a directional idea. But what we found is that it's very exacting. We have been doing the same shift from me to we or we to me um, every forty years for the last three thousand years without exception. Hmm. We do it over and over and over and over again. And 
Um, now, there's big, huge cultural um, things that come from that. Things can get pretty scary when you look at the cultural implications, but it certainly gave us massive insight mm -hmm. from a marketing and sales standpoint how to better communicate with our audience, which was what the initial intention was. Mm -hmm. And so based upon that, we we know is we shifted from a me cycle, which was 1963 to 2003, into a we cycle, which is 2003 to 2043, that we had to look for different tools in communication and marketing to be effective because what worked in a me cycle would not work in a we cycle. As Marshall Woodsmith said, would say, what got you here won't get you there. When right. you shift from one cycle to another, what, what worked before will not work in the current cycle. Right. And so this then allowed us to create um, and find new processes and systems for effective marketing and effective advertising and effective communication. So what's some of the things people should be thinking about as far as our marketing and messaging goes because we are in a we cycle? Well, I, I think maybe in contrast, we should, should we should give some examples. Sure. The previous We Cycle started in 1923. It was from 1923 to 1963, um, and in that time frame, we saw the Great Depression. We saw the uh, the we, we we saw prohibition against alcohol and tobacco in North America. Uh, in a We Cycle, it's about doing what's best for society as a whole. So. Alcohol and tobacco cannot be good for society. It creates criminality and addiction and other problems. So we had it. We got rid of it temporarily. Um, we saw the New Deal come in. We saw socialism come in, in in the form of the New Deal in the United States. We saw socialism and communism come in in, in major format over in Europe. We saw the rise of communism in Russia. We saw the the rise of t totalitarianism in uh, in Germany and in Italy and other parts of of Europe. Um, and we start. We started to see we go too far. There was a value in coming together for the common good, uh, but then, uh, especially in Europe, we saw we go too far. And in when we take we too far, what happens is is what we call witch hunts. And in the history of mankind, every single witch hunt has always happened around the zenith of a we cycle, hmm. right? Every single witch hunt. The um, again, eighty years ago, you had Mussolini, you had Stalin, you had Hitler. In the United States, most Americans forget that we had um, Japanese intern camps and we had Joseph McCarthy and the Red Scare that all fell within the uh, with ar around the zenith of the we. Mm -hmm. um, right? That's taking we too far. Let's protect. Let's insulate. Let's do its best for 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 the group, not for the individual. Um, right. So then, when you hit 1953. We start. We, we started taking we too far. It's again here in North America when we have Joseph McCarthy and the Red Scare, and the youth of society are starting to reject this this mentality, and they start looking for alphas to emerge. And we see the first alphas emerge that predict what's going to happen in the next cycle ten years before the beginning of the next cycle. So we see alphas in literature and technology emerge in 1953. Uh, mm. We see the release of A Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger, which talked about a book uh, or a character in Holden Caulfield, which rejected society, which re rejected his parents, which rejected his government, rejected his school, just rejected all of the conformity that existed in society and was screaming out for the, for individual expression. We mm -hmm. see the release uh, in, the, in the early 1950s of uh, Jack Kerouac uh, and, and On the Road and his, his uh, drug-induced adventures through middle century America where what is he doing? He's holding Caulfield out there looking for that sense of freedom and self-expression. In 1953, we see the release of this magazine that was a, a magazine that, about uh, exclusivity and, and about lifestyle for men. It was, a, it, it was about um, being bigger and better than who you could be as a man. And when Playboy was first released, it wasn't about pornography. It wasn't about nudity. In fact, most people don't realize that between 53 and, and 1960, there were less than a dozen actual images of nudity that weren't drawn in the magazine. Yeah, there's plenty of cartoon nudity, but very little actual nudity. Marilyn Monroe's uh, image on the first uh, Playboy, she wasn't naked. She was just in lingerie. Like right. th there was no actual nudity in the, in the, in the magazine. So um, Playboy was an alpha uh, as was Jack Kerouac and, and, and Holden, and Holden Caulfield, um, 
um, or J.D. Salinger predicting of what would, what would happen in the upcoming me cycle. And then five years before the tipping point in 1958, we always see alphas emerge in music. And of course, we see um, in 1958, we see Elvis Presley come out as the, as the, the, the white, uh, white man singing a black man's music, shaking his hips and doing the whole thing. And he really introduced rock and roll in in both uh, well most of, uh, of Western society, he came before the Beatles. He came before everybody else, and he really popularized this new form of of music, which came from blues, which came from the African American culture called rock and roll. And then we get in, and then over the next five years, we move into 1963, the beginning of the last we cycle. Now, their me cycle. The me cycle was from 1963 until 2003. And a music cycle it starts off about freedom and self-expression, and it moves into becoming plastic and phony. So in 1963, we see the Beatles um, uh, storm Europe and the United States. Um, we see um, people like, um, oh, what's his name? And Eric Clapton, um, Bob Dylan sing songs like how many roads must one man walk down before they call him a man. Again, it goes from community thing to the, th the, the thought about the individual. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you move from 63, you hit Woodstock, it progressively gets more about freedom and self-expression. And then we start to take, um, me too far. And, but in, in 1973, we're 10 years be, uh, after the beginning, after the tipping point, the beginning of the me cycle, and we start to see the expression of, of taking too, uh, me too far. So in 73, we're 20 years after Playboy came out, and 1973 was the first year that we saw full frontal nudity in a magazine, in, in Playboy. It took them 20 years to go from kind of the old weed mindset where, where it's really about sophistication and exclusivity in men's life and men's lifestyle to now we're going to take it over the top and be about sex and be, it'd be about that, that, that plastic side of, of sex. Um, we, in the 1970s, we, we see this progression into phony and plastic nature. We see, you know, um, the, the song by, by the village people, YMCA, we see the release of, of, um, disco and just the whole, the whole, uh, the whole fat around that and, and how, Really and truly, we became kind of a plastic and phony society. And by 1983, the zenith of the last me cycle, we were really headed into this plastic and phony mindset. Then, of course, in 1983, Michael Jackson released his biggest album, Thriller. Madonna came uh, came out with her first album, in which she sang the the the, the song, the, the anthem of the 1980s, the plastic 80s. Uh, um, her, her song Material Girl because she sang because we are living in a material world and I am your material girl in, 1980, in January of 1984 we see Apple Computer come out with their now famous infamous ad uh, that compared um, uh, other PC computer makers to um, Big Brother from the book uh, George Orwell's book 1984 and of course, by 19, actually 1984, we as a society were so far into a me cycle that we rejected any level of conformity that, as, as was discussed in Orwell's 1984. So the ad, of course, became the biggest ad mm -hmm. from, from, the, from 1963 until 2003, like the biggest ad. It was the epitome of the me cycle. So from 1983 on until 2003, We've hit the zenith, and we're now on the the downturn. Of course, you can we can all remember hair bands and Kiss and other bands from from the 1980s, but the youth of society start to reject this. So we see in 1988, um, we start to hear music become a little a little bit more real and depressing. We see the Cure come out, the Pesh Mode, uh, Nine Inch Nails releases Pretty Hate Machine in 1989. We see in the ghetto. Uh, of LA, we see NWA uh, re uh, release their first album, uh, Straight Out of Compton. We s start to see this the shift in music, and then by 1991, we move up to Seattle, where the grunge movement is born. And so you have, and and, and back down to LA and to New York, where we have gangster rap that is now full fledged for the youth of society. And what did gangster rap talk about? The reality of what it was like growing up in the ghetto. Now, this is not popularized. 
nationwide. This is the beginning of the youth, the youth movement rejecting the me mindset of being bigger and better than who you are and the shift into let's be real raw and relevant. Let's just tell – Ian, all that, dog. Let's just, let, let's just say it how it is, right? And so, it, so you have gangster rap that comes out that tells it, how, tells it real as it is in the ghetto and at the same time – you have um, Nirvana and Pearl Jam and Stone Temple Pilots and the entire grunge movement that is born that kind of addresses what it's like growing up in middle class America with apathetic parents, right? This is this is for the youth of America. This is real and and raw. And then so by '93, we're looking for alphas to emerge in literature and technology because again, that happens ten years before the tipping point, right. and sometimes they emerge together. And in '93 we see the precursor to the internet. In 1993, American Online went public, and contrary to what Al Gore says, AOL was the real purveyor or inventor of the internet. And we started receiving those those you know those CDs in the mail from uh, right. or in our Cracker Jack box or on the airplanes or really anywhere you, you would look you would find those AOL CDs they gave you 25 hours I probably still have some laying around yeah right they, they were everywhere but yeah. AOL was what popularized and really created the the internet for us and that was both content and technology together right that's that that's what we saw we also saw, see the release in 93 of strauss and Howe's book generations Faith popcorn's book um uh the, the popcorn effect was released in i believe uh 1991 so we have all these things that are coming out at the same time now we fast forward from 93 to 98 five years before the beginning of this we cycle so we should see alphas emerge in music. Someone like Chuck Berry, who was the real innovator of rock and roll, or or Elvis Presley, to emerge. And of course, we found that purveyor of the next type of popularized music in Eminem, who, like Elvis, was a white man singing a black man's music. Only this time, he was talking about what it was like growing up in the ghetto of. Uh, on the wrong side of Eight Mile in Detroit, so the, doing the, he did the exact same thing. I'm going to do the exact same thing for music that Elvis Presley did back in 1958 and 1998, right? And it, it, when we go back to Playboy in 1953, what's interesting is that Playboy um, was a precursor um, and a predictor of the Me Cycle because they they did things like um, they they had the first integrated TV show on CBS. Most people don't know that they brought in uh, members of different races onto their show, including African Americans. They um, they they started having in 1956. Um, musicians from this new form of mu music called rock and roll start contributing articles to Playboy in the late 50s, early 60s. You can see articles by the by members of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and others. Really amazing what they were able to do. But what they didn't do as we transitioned from me back into we is they forgot who they were. They forgot where they started, where they started from. And they did not include any um, articles by rappers in Playboy until 2005. Hmm. Wow! It, it was seven years after the after um, the uh, the um, uh, the predictors of what would happen in music uh, were were changing music. Um, by 2003, rap was the only music that was winning that was at the top of the billboards. It was the only music that was winning. Um, Grammys, it was the predominant music style for another couple, couple of years until country came in and from a country standpoint started doing the same thing that rap was doing, talking mm -hmm. about what it was like to be real. Um, and so we, we, we go from Eminem in 1998, we, we see in 99 the release of the first reality TV show publicly with Survivor. We see the release of You're Fired with Donald Trump in 2000. We, we see the, the permutations of reality TV. Now note that reality TV started on MTV back in the early 90s and I, in about 92, 93 with the TV show The Real World. Mm. Again, going back to the youth who be, who created the movement from me to we talking about let's just be re let's just be real about this, right? Mm -hmm. So then we move into 2003, we hit we we move into a we cycle. Now at the beginning of a we cycle again it's about coming together and doing what's best for the common good. It's about society as a whole. It's not about me. It's about we. And isn't it surprising that that in the early 2000s, you have the release of 
uh, of Google, late 90s, early 2000s, the release of Google. We see, we see the release of MySpace in the late 2000s. And then around 2004, we have um, YouTube. 2004, 2005, we have Facebook. 2005, 2006, we have Twitter. We have LinkedIn. We see the, the release of a technology, a technology set in social media that's not about the individual, but is about the emulation of community and group and bringing people together for the common good. Social media was a result, a technological result of moving uh, of uh, of moving from me to we, and the people who created social media were kids. They were the kids that grew up in a me cycle who rejected the me mentality and said, it's not about me, it's about we as a group. Let's come together and do what's best for society as a whole. And as we've moved into this we cycle, we see the release of social technology in terms of social funding, right? Crowdsource and Indiegogo and other uh, uh, technology sites like 99designs mm. and uh, all of these sites that are about crowdfunding and, uh, and crowdsourcing information or money to, do what's, to, to be able to create things. This kind of mentality would never have worked back in a me cycle mm -hmm. because it, it's about community, not about the individual. Yeah. So we're, we're now fully into this we cycle and we, we see um, our, our music that, that's successful talking about coming together, doing what's best for groups. Uh, Lady Gaga represented the represented what she called the freaks, the, the her her dirty little monsters, right? You listen to um, Eminem has has stayed very very successful. You look at at um, um, at uh, music like Adele. What does Adele talk about? Her music's not particularly uplifting. It's kind of a little little depressing. It's pretty darn real. She um, in two thousand and eleven, she and Eminem represented something like 30% of all album sales mm -hmm. in the industry, kind of saved the music industry financially. Um, and she's, uh, Adele said about herself, yeah, I'm fat. I like to drink. I like to smoke. I like to eat. That's who I am, right? That's, that's, that's real. But in, in the 1980s, it, you had to be Madonna. You had to have a perfect body, probably a boob job, plastic surgery, the whole thing. We wanted – we we promoted it in a me cycle being bigger and better than who you were. Yeah. So in a me cycle, what you look at from a marketing standpoint is yeah. that communication is about pushing people to be bigger and better than who they are. Forms of direct marketing are very relevant in a me cycle because we want to be pushed to be bigger than, than who we are. But in a we cycle, let's look at the technology. Google is not a push technology. It's a pull technology. It's an inbound technology. Social media is not a push technology. It's a conversational technology. It's an inbound or pull-based technology. Um, in a me cycle, it can be about dialogue. In a we cycle, it has to be about um, conversation. In a me cycle, it's about push. In a we cycle, it's about pull. In a me cycle, it's about transaction. In a we cycle, it's about relationship. Um, in a me cycle, you can be a pickup artist. In a we cycle, it's about building the long term relationships, mm -hmm. right? So that so that understanding the shift from from me to we has given Roy and I a huge competitive advantage because we know what tools and devices that we need to use that are relevant in a me cycle or in a we cycle. We know why social media was uh, popular. We actually predicted in '97 who would win the presidential election, hmm. not based upon um, who is popular or money, but based upon pendulum theory, right? Hmm. We looked at on, on the Democratic side, you had Hillary Clinton and Obama, and on the Republican side, you had uh, Romney, um, Mike Huckabee, and John McCain. So we look at pendulum theory, me versus we. On the Democratic side, you had Hillary Clinton, who's a feminist. Is that a me modality or a we mentality? And you had Obama, who was a community organizer. Is that me or we? On the Republican side, you had um, you had Romney, who come, uh, who comes off as too perfect. He's got the perfect family. He's clean. He's all business. He's not believable. He's not real raw or relevant. And he's viewed as more me. Regardless of his message, he promotes himself at, or presents himself very me. You look at um, you look at Mike Huckabee, who is a pastor. Uh, he was a social populist and might have been more we. And then and then you had John McCain. W what was John McCain's nickname? He was a maverick. Is a maverick a me or a we mindset? Well, I would say a maverick, the term maverick means that you stand against the grain and you, and you do what you think is right. I would say that's pretty much a me, 
uh, and be Brown. So everybody could, on the Republican side could blame George Bush. Had nothing to do with it. We picked Obama to win the election before the primaries simply based upon um, what the candidate stood for because he was the – um, he was a community organizer, which best fit the mode and modality of the we cycle that we're in. Yeah. So, what strategy do you take now that take it back to book sales for a second? Now we're in a we cycle. What kind of strategies do you employ uh, in the past year or lately? Because you know that, and it's interesting because in the book you do talk about pre- you can make certain predictions based off of what we're in. So. We've been constantly, I mean, a good marketer is a student of history and is a student of psychology and will constantly uh, update and and upgrade and polish and optimize what they're doing. So we're always changing things. But um, what we've been focusing on now for the last 10 years is on what is necessary to build the relationships. Now, for those of you in business and marketing, oh yeah, relationship marketing and authenticity and all of those things, those are all catchphrases. I've been talking about this since 2003. So it may sound like I'm just picking up on what's popular. I've been talking about this for a very, very, very long time. But the difference is for me, it's not just talking about it. And it's not simply looking at the tactics that now exist that were created within this we cycle, but understanding the the overarching strategy that the tactics fit in. Mm -hmm. And so for us, within our agency, it's about the uh, it's about understanding how do you build relationships at the end of the day um in a we cycle selling a book is selling information that's what you're really selling and to be able to do that you have to be able to get someone to read your content you have to develop intimacy and relationship with them the biggest issue in selling a book the biggest currency in selling a book isn't the twenty dollars to buy the book it's the four six or eight hours to read the book sure, right yeah. so how do you go from being on a radio show how do I go from an interview like this to selling my book pendulum which will take you six hours to read it's an incongruent mm-hmm. step to go from he- hearing me as an author talk about my book here and then asking you to spend six hours to read the book mm-hmm. not that I don't want your audience to do that I do but that's a that's that's a huge that's a six time disconnect there yeah. it's a disconnect it's a six time investment so what we look at is what are the steps of intimacy that have to be built hmm. in order to be able to build long-term relationships. And here's the, the thing to note, and we'll, we'll get into this. Yeah. The, um, the, the thing to note is that the things that you do that are transactionary um, are in conflict with the things that build relationships. Right. Um, so think about it this way, and we'll we'll get into this. If you a pickup artist may be able to go out to a bar and get laid, but they're not building long term relationships. On the other side, if I go out and build a relationship with with a woman, and then I treat that I treat her as a sexual object, I'm not going to have a long term relationship with that with that woman. Right. The two are in diametric conflict with each other. That doesn't mean that there isn't a value in some of the tactics that are applied in transactional marketing. And that doesn't mean that there there yeah. aren't values on the other side. Yeah. It's the contextual understanding yeah. of the application of those tools together. And so because my clients are all thought leaders, I'm not dealing with someone selling a can of soup. I'm dealing with creating community and creating relationship. Mm -hmm. For us, everything that we do is focused on what are the things necessary to build relationships. And the old school of thought, and we hear this a lot, is what's called um, uh, sales funnels. Now, sales funnel is a direct marketing tactic to be able to, to get a customer into a sales process and to push them from one step to the next. Now, in a me cycle, you can do that effectively because what you're, what you're doing is you're positioning it so that you're telling them that you're, you'll be bigger and better than who you are and accomplish your objective. And if you, if you don't do these things, then you won't. I'm going to push you. That's, that's a sales process. But when you pull, what you're looking at is a conversion process. And, the, and they're very different mindsets, mm-hmm. right? To convert someone is to give them the information that they need to take the actions that they've already predetermined that they want to take. When we look at selling something, 
um, you, you learn sales objections because you, you learn what are the things that, 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 that the consumer is going to, or that the consumer or the business might have that you need to overcome. The reality is that when you're looking at marketing and advertising, that's always done in non-intimate environments. An intimate environment, you and I are in an intimate environment right now because we, we can see each other, we can play off of each other, we can hear each other's tonations and body language and play off of each other. Your listeners, on the other hand, are in a non-intimate environment. Now, the fact that you and I are engaging kind of emulates intimacy for them, but they're still in a non-intimate environment. And so what we look at in terms of marketing is what are the things that we can do, like we're doing now, to emulate intimacy in a non-intimate environment mm -hmm. to allow us to create that long-term relationship. Right. And sales funnels don't allow us to do that. Sales funnels aren't about intimacy. Sales funnels are about, I'm going to push you to take an action and you're not going to get the result you want unless you take this action. And that violates the ability to build a long-term relationship. A sales funnel is being a pickup artist, right? If your goal is to get a transaction, your, your goal is to get late, you can do that, but you're not going to have repeat customers. You're going to get people who come in and get their thing and come out. And even if you deliver everything that you say, the probability of that person coming back is very small. And that's even true for me. If I have a customer who comes in and says, I want you to make me a New York Times bestseller, they only come in for that transaction. I can deliver the bestseller, and I do. I'll deliver them a bestseller. They'll be very happy, but they're not, they're not, no matter what I do, they didn't come in relationally. They came in transactionally. And they're not really in a position where they're where they want to build a relationship with me. Mm -hmm. It's just like if you went in to get your oil changed, right, at a Jiffy Lube or somewhere else. If you went into the location and that location had free drinks and wine and champagne and scotch and had a place for the kids to play and video games and and it was just amazing customer service, and you're getting your oil changed and they do your oil change. Um, there's you, you had a great experience. You might talk about that experience, but the probability of you going back to that same oil company isn't based on that experience. It's based on the proximity of of getting an oil change when you have the need, mm -hmm. right? It's not. It, it, it's I had great customer service, great experience. I created word of mouth, but it does. It's not a guarantee of me going back to that same drift loop. I might. I might have that as consideration, but if I'm on the other side of town, I need it done. And there's a Jiffy Lube right there. I'm probably going to go there. I'm probably not going to drive to the other side of town because I just need to get it done. So you have to consider the difference between transaction and relationship. And if you're building a business based on a relationship, which anyone in any level of thought leadership is, you cannot rely on transactional pickup artist tactics mm -hmm. to be able to build those relationships. In fact, it violates your ability to build those relationships. So that, that's where 12 steps of intimacy come in. Right. Yeah. When I asked about, you know, I kind of surveyed different top entrepreneurs I knew who was about to release a book or planning to in the future. And I asked you last time, you know, some of their questions like, you know, what did you do to promote to get someone the New York best, you know, New York Times bestseller? What does engagement look like after the book launch? You know, what are some of the media secrets? Do you recommend, you know, uh, do you recommend a whole site or a page on a current site when, you know, for a book website and you answered with how we build a platform in that relationship goes into the 12 steps of intimacy by Desmond Morris. So talk yes. about, talk about that. Well, again, it goes, it goes back to the, the experience. First of all, I, if I have a relationship with you, I might have the right to ask you to read my book. That means that I've spent the time um, to properly cultivate that relationship. And so a book is a really great tool to deepen relationships with existing relationships. Mm -hmm. A book is also a really great excuse to go out and start having conversations about, about who you are, mm -hmm. but it would not be appropriate for you to sell your book uh, directly immediately to someone who doesn't know who you are unless they have an immediate meet, need right now that you can meet right now with the book and then as a transaction and they're probably not going to come back and work with you. It's just a transactionary uh, experience. So um, Roy and I, when we looked at Pendulum and the shift from push to pull, we looked at the, and, and the movement from transaction to relationship. We said, what industry best deals with relationship uh, d d dealing with relationships. And of course, what we came up with was marriage counseling. 
right? So then we started researching in, into, re, into marriage counseling and how today uh, most marriage counselors deal with problems in relationships. And what we found is that a lot of relationship counselors today base their counseling upon the work of Desmond Morris and his 12 Steps of Intimacy. So what we have to do is, or 12 Steps of Seduction, what we have to do is back up then to who is Desmond Morris and, and why, why did he right. do the work? And right. I, I don't mean to offend your audience. As an aside, yes. Michael, yes, yeah, so I ordered the book, obviously, after we talked. It, it arrived yesterday, so I put it on my, my book stand, and my wife, who's a, a psychologist, uh, goes, what, what's this? It says like something like the covers intimacy. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I don't know why you even told me about this. You know, why did Michael have to tell me about this and you didn't? So we had this conversation. She's like, why are you reading that book <laughs> type of thing? It was really funny. That's funny. Yeah. That's really funny, actually. This is... uh, you know, there you go. I mean, we, we come to, to, to our conclusions different ways. Um, but so, so what happened was, in, in human psychology, there was a, a question as to whether or not the, the we can debate religion later, but whether or not um, the Homo sapien primate was a promiscuous or pair bonded primate. You see, in primates, we range from promiscuous, the bonobos, to pair bonded like the chimpanzee or the gorilla. And how, and I don't mean to be gross about this, this is just an, an, anatomical, but how pair bonded or promiscuous the species of primate was is based upon the size of the male testicle of that species. Well, hmm. really? It just so, yeah. And it just so happens that the Homo sapien male is smack in between all the primate species. So there was a question what are we, promiscuous or pair bonded? And so Desmond Morris researched the Homo sapien animal in the wild, in, in cities and everywhere. And um, what he discovered is that homo sapiens prefer the security of a pair bonded relationship. They may still desire to have promiscuity, but they want mm -hmm. and desire first and foremost the security of that pair bonded relationship. And so he then asked the question, okay, so then what defines a long-term relationship? And what he discovered is that at the foundational level of all relationships that there's these 12 fundamental steps that must be followed. Mm -hmm. Uh, call them the 12 steps of seduction, the 12 steps of, of intimacy. And it, it, what he found is that if you skip more than one of these steps, so any two steps, steps three and four, five and eight, 10 and 11, it doesn't really matter what it is. If you skip more than um, any one of these steps, that the probability of, the, it, of that relationship being a long-term relationship was less than... Five percent. Hmm. Now I'm going to stop right there because we are now starting to have massive hail, and I suspect that it's going to get very loud and not conducive for an interview, and that I probably am going to have to move downstairs. All right. Yeah, we should have prefaced with that where you are. There is a tornado warning. So <laughs> I sincerely apologize. I don't know if this is live or being recorded, but no, uh, yeah, cool. it's. It so is, do, you, um, do you want to postpone it for another day or do you want to pick it up? Do you want to move and pick it up? Uh, if, you're in, me, if you're in harm's way, I don't want you to get swept away or whatever. Let me so. move Let me move down. Well, let me move downstairs um, where it will be quieter. And if uh, we have a tornado or anything else, we'll lose power. So let me let, give you a second. Let me move this downstairs. All right. So, yeah. So you were saying how kind of the thought process behind how you came to uh, the platform, you know, building a platform, which is you looked at marriage counseling and then who learned from marriage counselor or who they learned from Desmond Morris. And then you were starting on the, the 12 steps of intimacy to how someone builds a platform based off of the relationships. Right. So, so when we moved into looking at the, the basis of that and the fact that uh, of marriage counseling and the fact that at the foundational level of, of any relationship, um, according to the work of Desmond Morris, that the couple must go through these 12 steps and they can't skip more than one step. And that if in fact they skip more than one step, any two steps, three and four, four and five, eight and 10, 10 and 11, it doesn't matter what they are. If you skip more than one of these steps, that the psychological damage to the two parties is the same as having a one night stand. Hmm. Now, if you are interested in a transaction, that's fine, but that doesn't lead to a successful long-term relationship. And in fact, less than 5% of those relationships that skipped more than one step ended up being a long-term relationship. Mm -hmm. 
And so what we then asked ourselves is, what is the difference, the psychological difference between building a intimate relationship with a pair bonded partner or the psychological difference between building a pair bonded relationship with a customer or a client. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what we said is that there's some, some physical things that might be different, like the step 12 is, uh, is sexual intimacy. Um, that you probably won't have with your customer, but <laughs> the, not, yeah. but the principle, but the principles maintain the same. If you look at the, the twelve steps, principally, not in terms of the specific action, then you can get mm -hmm. to the same, to the same result. And so, right. um, what we look at is that it, there are four currencies exchanged in interpersonal relationships: time, energy, information, and emotion. Mm -hmm. In business, we exchange three of the of those same four currencies: time, energy, information. But instead of emotion, we exchange money. That's not to say that emotion isn't a valid part of the process, but the exchange that we we really make in business is not emotion, but the financial exchange. Mm -hmm. And so the key is knowing when it's appropriate to ask for different forms of currencies based upon where the customer is within the building of that relationship. Right, right. Right. It's it's inappropriate to ask for too much time or too much information or too much energy or even money at different stages during that development of the relationship of the business. So when we look at the 12 steps, th there's a direct corollary between the two. Now, step, s step 12 is sex, right? Um, for a business, that would be the equivalent of what uh, whatever your primary product or service was, your, mm -hmm. your most expensive, the biggest investment of relationship right. would be at step 12. Mm -hmm. Step one is eye to body. So in the interpersonal context, it would be I'm at a club or a restaurant or an event. I look across the room and I see a beautiful woman and I make a snap decision. Now that woman does not control who sees her. She doesn't control how they see her or the judgment that they make. The only thing that she controls is how she presents herself. And that's the only control that she has. The same is true in business. At step one, eye to body, that's when you as a business are seen by your customer in a medium that you do not control. This could be a TV ad, a radio ad. This could be being interviewed on, uh, on this show, uh, on a radio show. This could be any form of PR, any form of media, this could be um, a post on Facebook or LinkedIn, this could be a Google search, this could be any environment where you're being presented that you do not have control. As an example, if we use Google to illustrate the point, if you if you if your website comes up in a web on a Google result search, um, the only thing that you can control is how your result shows up. You can't control what's above it. You can't control what's below it. You can't control any of the context around you. Not really. Some SEO experts. Unless you're you like can. an SEO master, right? And you can get maybe, to the top. But yeah, I know what you mean. But, yeah. but, but, but really, I mean, you might be able to push yourself up, but you can't control anything else that's going on around, around you in that context. You can only con control how you present yourself. So step one is meeting the customer where they're at in a, me in, in a medium where you're being seen by your customer. Step two is eye to eye. So step one is eye to body. I see the beautiful woman. Step two is eye to eye. I see the beautiful woman. The beautiful woman sees me. Now this is where the concept of flirting comes in. Remember we're dealing with currency. So at step one, there's a micro bit of information and a micro bit of time that's been invested into that decision. Mm -hmm. At step two, I see the beautiful woman, the beautiful woman sees me, right? But I don't have the currency to look at that beautiful woman for a long period of time. I can look at you in person or on a call in the eye for a short period of time because we have an established relationship. I can look at my wife for an even longer period of time because we have an even longer and deeper established relationship. I can do the same with my mom or my twin or my siblings because I have an established relationship. But how long I can look at someone in the eyes before it gets un uncomfortable right. is based upon the depth of the relationship. And I promise you, no matter who it is, there's a length of time that you can look at someone before it becomes uncomfortable for you and for the other party. Right. So when you're beginning a relationship at eye to eye, again, flirting occurs because you don't have the 
currency deposited into the relationship by both parties to look at them for a long period of time. So you have this exchange of I look, I look at the beautiful woman, I look away, she looks at me. I turn back to look at the beautiful woman, she, she looks away. So we have that micro exchange of energy mm -hmm. and information between the two of us. Right. So in the marketing context, this would be where the, I see I, – you do Google – I do a Google search. I see your result. I click on the link and I go over to your site. Now, if you know that, that the person who clicked on the link is a successful entrepreneur, business owner um, who's a – in Myers-Briggs terminology, an intuitive thinking type, um, you know that I'm more likely to be from – New York or California, um, and you know that the reason that I did the search was for whatever the reason was, then you can speak to both my stated felt need and my unstated felt need in the language that's important to me so that I, as the customer, feel seen by you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you have like a message once they hit the page that they can relate to? In their language yeah. about their stated and their unstated need. Again, this is... In, in in this context, this is marketing. It's in a non-intimate environment. Mm -hmm. Right. So that means we have to do the work for the customer. They're not act, actually going to feel seen by us. We have to do all of that heavy lifting for them. Right, right, right. Right. So it's eye to eye. The next step in uh, interpersonal relationships, um, well, if you flirt with someone, the next thing that you probably are not going to do is walk up and kiss them. Right, probably if, not. No. If you did, you're likely to get smacked, and if you don't, and you would deserve it, and if you didn't get smacked, the woman or the other person would be communicating to you that they're looking for a transaction. Right? They're not communicating that they want depth of relationship. They're looking for the immediacy of a transaction, and that changes the dynamics of what's going on. More reasonably, after flirting with someone, you're going to go up and have a conversation with them. So. Um, what you're looking at is voice to voice, mm -hmm. having a conversation. That seems pretty mm -hmm. reasonable and rational, mm -hmm. right? But what direct marketers want you to do is skip steps of intimacy because they want you to get to, to the currency of cap of money as quickly as possible. So they, they like to skip this. So for us, when we work with clients, we prefer to use blog posts as our landing pages, mm -hmm. not landing pages. And the reason for that is we want to allow the consumer the opportunity to engage with us and our customers. So we want to be, we allow for commenting, we allow for the connection into Facebook and Twitter and other forms of social media. We want that engagement. And we advise and recommend that all of our clients always communicate back to those who comment on their blog because what we're creating is a conversation and it is our responsibility. Mm -hmm to show our willingness to engage in that conversation. Again, remember this is done in a non-intimate environment. So right. step three is voice to voice. Yeah. Step four um, is hand to hand. Now this would be, you're, you're, you've, the, you've walked up to the beautiful woman at the club or the bar or the restaurant or the event and you've talked to her and what both parties are looking for is to see if there's enough Agreed upon synergy. Assuming that I didn't think the there's woman some was, chemistry going on. There's chemistry, right? Yeah. The, uh, the voice to voice identified that she's not dumb as rock, and that our values are some somewhat <laughs> aligned, so yeah. that I can see that there, there there might be some alignment there. Now I'm looking for chemistry, and so um, in interpersonal relationships, this would be playing footsies under the table. This would be where you slide your hand over, and you know, your your finger touches her finger, or whatever else. It's that micro energetic engagement to verify the agreement and alignment of chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, now what most direct marketers do here is they go straight into asking for a name and email address. But in our opinion, this is an inappropriate time to do that because asking for, for a name and email address is like asking the woman out on a date. Can I get your name and phone number? Then you need to you need to work into that first. So what we will do is we will make white papers and reports and other bits of content available for free um, on the website without asking for an email address. So for a straight down download, right? It's I, I, I want you as the consumer to know that I can deliver massive value for you, meet your needs, and that 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 I want you to invest back into the relationship by spending the time to go through mm -hmm. that content. It's it's a, any relationship. 
is an ebb and a flow of back and forth exchange of currency by both parties. You have to ask your consumer to, to invest currency as well because if they don't, they're, they won't have the value for the relationship that, that they're building with you. Mm-hmm. So there has to be an equal exchange of currency between the two parties. And so we will oftentimes put in a reporter or wipe it for free download. The other thing... So no emails required for this? Not yet. Correct? Okay, got it. Not yet. That's not to say that we won't ask. There is a time to ask the other party for their name and phone number, right? You want to continue the relationship? Yeah. I'd like to take you on a date. There's an appropriate time for that. But this is a little too early for that. We need to verify that there's enough interest by both parties, mm-hmm. not just... I'm. She's a beautiful woman. I'm interested, and she's not, right? right? She'll have a conversation with me because she's being polite. I need to validate and verify that she's interested in, interested as well. Same thing right. with the customer. So oftentimes what we'll do, uh, and HubSpot does this fairly well, although they do ask for an email address, is we'll go from a blog post that includes commenting on social media, but we'll link at the bottom of that blog post to a longer white paper or a report that gives a further expression of the uh, the, the blog post addresses one topic. The white paper might address five or seven topics um, within that same sub- subject family, right. right? So that we can expand upon the investment so that we can get to what the real issue actually is. It's usually not the, the topical or tactical problem. It's usually some other bigger issue that has to be addressed. So then you move it from uh, – so, so we'll do a report. The other thing that we'll do is what we call a reverse opt-in. Mm-hmm. And so we'll do an assessment or a quiz of some kind. Uh, it's, it, it oftentimes will do it in context of something like, you know, that you probably see on Facebook, what kind of Disney character are you? Now, we, we do that not because we want to know what Disney character you are. We actually will do it relevant to the scenario or sequence that the consumer is. So we had a, an author that, that, that taught on leadership, right? So we, we had a, a – um, a leadership assessment. What kind of leader are you? Hmm. Right. So it's clear to the scenario, um, but it, it allows us to do two things. It allows us. Um, we usually add in a Myers Briggs assessment in because we want to know what our customer's Myers Briggs temperament is. And secondly, um, we what we what we want to do is help the customer feel seen by us. Um, Copy Blogger did a study with AWeber about five years ago now, and they wanted to see what subject line got the greatest open rates um, across the board, across industry. Mm-hmm. And what they found was that there was one subject line that got great open rates, whether it was for Viagra or um, nonfiction books or self-help or diet or selling candy or anything else. And the subject line was, you are not alone. Hmm. Most people feel, feel alone. And the objective at the beginning of building a relationship is to help your customer, customer feel seen and heard. Every single one of our clients that come to us, believe, to my company and all of my clients' company, believe that they are unique snowflakes and that their problem is unique to them and them alone and that, that unless they are given personalized attention, that we couldn't possibly have the solution to their problem. I don't know if that's your experience. That is that is our experience. And right. the truth is, it's, that's not the case. Right. There's actually a limited number of potential uh, problems or solutions. But everyone feels alone, and that's true in business right. and in interpersonal and yeah. and in their personal yeah. life. But your particular problem is unique to you in your business, and no other businesses are. Yeah. Which is which is just not the case. But mm-hmm. people feel that way. It's an emotional position that people take. So. At the beginning of building a relationship, as a business owner, your objective is to help your customer feel seen and heard so that they don't feel alone. So we like to, so we like to use a reverse opt-in there so that we can reflect back to the customer our knowledge of who they are. The reason we put in the Myers-Briggs is one, so that we can better communicate to them in their, lang- their Myers-Briggs language, but two, so that we can... Um, reflect back to them who they are. So you are a. We don't. We we won't pu- put in Myers Briggs stuff, but we'll pull in the language from Myers Briggs, knowing that if you're an intuitive thinking competitive type, we're going to say your leadership style is competitive. Now we'll use something else other than competitive, and here's your characteristics of your leadership style. So we're merging the Myers Briggs psychology with the the content of the of the client. And then using it to reflect back to the customer who they are. And the truth is, if we're 75% right, 
the customer feels seen most of the time by us, which means they're more ingratiated to want to communicate uh, and engage with us further. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then all future communications that we have with them is in their Myers-Briggs language. So they feel even more connected to us. So we, so what we do, we call it a reverse opt-in because we do the assessment up front and we don't, to give them a result, we don't ask for their name and email address. We give them a one-page result that says, this is who you are, right, based on whatever the, whatever the product is. Mm-hmm. But if you'd like to know how to, to accent your strengths and offset your weaknesses in the subject matter, opt in, give us your name and email address, and we'll send you the 30-page report on the same thing. So what we've done is reflected back to them who they are. We said these are all of your characteristic traits, your strengths and weaknesses. Now if you want the solution, you can opt in. The opt-in rate on that is like 70 to 80%. Hmm. Wow. When we reflect back to you who you are, it's a huge high level uh, conversion because you now feel seen by us. Does that make right. sense? Yeah, perfect sense, yeah. So so we do the, the front end of the reverse opt-in where we ask for them to, to answer 20 questions and we give them a result with no, no opt-in is at a step four. A step five is then where we ask for the opt-in and we give them the 20-page report, right? We've asked for their their information and we've asked for their time in investing into going through that report. Mm-hmm. Right? So step five, you go from, um, from hand-to-hand at step, at, at step four to hand-to-shoulder. Sh- hand so if I'm holding your hand here, Mm -hmm. The idea is I'm going to put my arm around your shoulder and pull you in closer Mm -hmm. to me. And again, remember that this is an I picture the guy in the movie theater, you know, like yawning and then, you know, putting the arm around the shoulder. Yeah. That's right. So you're pulling pulling it in. You're here and now you're pulling it in closer. You're you're getting more intimate. Right. So it's arm to shoulder. And at at this point, it... It's a little bit of art and a little bit of science. You have, every business model has a different has a different business model. What you have to define are what currencies you're asking for: time, energy, information, or money. Now, typically speaking, and there are exceptions, but typically speaking, we don't ask for the currency of money until step eight. Sometimes step nine, sometimes step ten, based upon the other currencies that we're asking for. Mm-hmm. As an example, at a step five for our client Garrett Gunnarsson, who does financial analysis, um, they will do a, a financial assessment of you as an individual. Mm-hmm. So you're going to go in and answer some pretty intimate information. Uh, it may take you 10, 20 minutes, but you put some detailed intimate information into that report. Then we move on to a step five or to, to mm-hmm. a step six from step five, where he then gets a uh, one of his coaches on the phone to review that assessment with the consumer, with the with the potential client, right? So now we're again, time and energy are the are the currencies being exchanged. Yeah. So a time fi- and typically speaking, by step five, you can ask for two currencies, a, or a little, a, a lot of one, or a little bit of a, of two currencies. Um, so it's hand to shoulder. The next step um, after hand to shoulder is hand away. So I could take a a, a woman with my arm around her and pull her in and kiss her, but it's kind of an awkward movement for all parties involved. Even if she wanted it, it's awkward. Okay. And part of this is about respecting your customer. We want to let the customer say, slow down, or I'm not ready, or no. Right. right. That's, we, we, do that, we do that in dating. We need to do that with, we need to do that with our customers. Right. In, in essence, this is a dating process that we're going through and right. building intimacy with our customers. We have to allow them to move at their rate as right. slowly or quickly as they want to move. Yeah. And, um, you know, this is amazing stuff, Michael. You're in hand to waste. But I just want to point out there were about six minutes past the hour. So I just wanted to make a note of that if you need to go or if you... Uh, due to the hail, no. can continue on. So let me know. Well, let's no. Let's go ahead and get through this. Let's get it done. I'd like to be able to <coughs> give your give your viewers yeah. this information. And um, yeah, I don't want to stop your flow here because this is great. So oh, no worries. But, but. Uh, and I've already had um, uh, uh, because my company's now all in the, the basement. They've already been rescheduling okay. calls because we took ten minutes off to to move down here. So okay, we're we're good to go. Um, so, so hand to waist. Yeah. Hand to, so you go from hand to shoulder, it's at five to hand to waist. Right? So I want to position the woman in front of me and put my hand around the waist. And that communicates to the woman my intent. Right now we're face to face. Now it's easier for me to kiss. I'm communicating to her my intent. And she can slow me down or stop me altogether. 
Now, again, it's an investment of time, energy, or information at this point. So for Garrett Gunderson, he'll go from the financial assessment at step five to a 30-minute uh, uh, um, on-the-phone consultative call with a coach to go through that information and to look to do kind of a an analysis of, of those numbers, mm-hmm. right? So you have to define for you what that means. You could also go from a reverse opt-in at a step five to doing what some of the direct marketers do with doing a three video sequence, or you can go into a webinar. You just have to look at what currencies you're asking to exchange mm-hmm. uh, between you and your audience. Yeah. So that then moves into a step seven. Step seven, I have my hand around the waist, now I'm gonna put hand to face. And the again, one of the most intimate things you can do is put hand your hand on someone's face. It's an incredibly intimate action. And the first time you kiss someone, it is directly communicating what your intention is. There's no question in someone's mind if you're staring, if you're looking face to face and you have your hand on their face, what your intention is. Right. Right. So again, we can ask for more time, more energy, more more information at this point. Uh, what Garrett will then do in his in his sequence is he'll go from the assessment at step five, the online on on the phone uh, uh, evaluation to sending out a more detailed assessment at step seven and then um, a, and a request to fill out even more intimate information at step step eight where they're going to spend an hour putting in all of their financial information at step eight. There's a more full, you know, not almost a SWOT analysis. You know, here's strengths and weaknesses and here's what you need to do. We need to gather more information before we can give you your tailored solution to your problem, mm-hmm. right? So s- step seven is hand to face. Step eight is kissing. Now we have the right potentially um, to ex- to um, ask for the currency of money. Not mm-hmm. necessarily, but we have the right to ask for the currency of money at step eight. Typically speaking, at a step eight, we can ask for four hours of someone's time. We can ask for some some semi-intimate information. We can ask for up to a hundred dollars of cash, and there's some things that we can we can ask for at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, what Garrett does at at step eight is he asks you to fill out detailed information um, for, to do a more detailed analysis of of where, of where you're at. Right, we have the right to sell a book at a step eight. It's a twenty dollars book, and we're asking them to spend four or six hours reading the book. Mm-hmm. We don't often sell a book at step eight. We will often move it to a step nine. But you have the right to sell a book at a step eight. Mm-hmm. Usually, at a step eight, I'm more likely to sell a one hour webinar for a hundred dollars mm-hmm. because most people are because the currency of time for most of our clients, customers is a great is a more valuable commodity than cash. Although that's not always the case, but but in that context, if it is, we're more likely to ask for more money and less time. Mm-hmm. Be, deliver more value with less time and more money. When someone says something isn't worth it, they're you, the, but whatever the product or service or event was, they're usually not saying it just wasn't worth the money. They're saying that it wasn't worth the combination of currencies that were spent. They just don't think about it that way. But that's the reality is they're investing different currencies mm. into that thing. Right. And so what you have to do is figure out what is the proper balance of currencies that you're asking for. Because it could be a price right, but you could be asking for too much time. So if you're asking for more time, then you need to reduce other currencies to offset the amount of time that you're asking for. That's true for all That's true mm. for all. Currencies. You have to make sure you've got the right balance of, of those currencies. Mm-hmm. So, step nine from step eight is kissing. Step nine is um, hand hand to body. Define that as you will. Heavy petting, whatever whatever you want. That's heavy petting. That's a good one. Yeah. Just just saying. It's it, <laughs> it's it's it's, it's hand to body. And and here we start to from step eight on. We move pretty quickly, right? It, things move fast. It takes eight steps. To, to get to kissing, and once right. we get there, it moves, it, it moves hot and heavy. Right. Um, we can ask for more time, more energy, more infor- more information, or more money. Typically speaking, we can now ask for eight hours of time. We can ask for up to a thousand dollars in cash. Uh, we can ask for more intimate information. Typically speaking, um, this is the level of most psychology when you're dealing with a therapist. Um, so step nine is is, is hand and body for Garrett. At step eight, he got a bunch more information 
detailed information. Step nine, they then do a 90 minute to two hour in depth analysis with the customer of where they are, are financially and they set up the strategy for uh, for the for that client. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of step nine is when they sell in to their primary product, which starts at $15,000, right? They go through 10 steps before they ask for a penny because within the sequence of what they're doing, that is what is necessary right. in order to be able to make that sell. So step yeah. nine is on the body. Yeah. Step, step 10 is mouth to body. And again, you can define that however you want to define it. But mouth, mouth, body. Again, we're getting far more intimate as we go through each of these steps. Now we can ask for more time, more energy, more information, uh, or more money. And at a step ten, we can ask for three days of time. We can ask for incredibly intimate information. We can ask for five to ten thousand dollars in money. Garrett's mm -hmm. he asks for a little, a little bit more based on his sequence, but typically it's five to ten thousand. Uh, right? We, we can now ask for more information. That then leads into step eleven. Well, step twelve, remember, is is sex. It's it, it, it's the intimate uh, relationships. And so, before you have sex, typically speaking, you need to get naked. You got to remove those clothes. Mm -hmm. Now, in business, sometimes being fully na metaphorically naked, mm -hmm. fully open and transparent yeah. to who you're working with is a very difficult thing. Clients that work with Garrett, they move into step 11 when they start working with them and they start managing the, the numbers. Right. So Garrett doesn't stop selling per se when he's working with a client. He has, has to actually have a, a sales process that is constantly selling the customer on the process that they're going through right. because they're now becoming naked metaphorically to Garrett when it comes to their finances and their numbers sure. and their relationships and everything else. I have a had a client, um, Brian Martin, who – was the founder of CDV.org, Children of Domestic Violence, and his primary objective was to get people to step 11. Step 11 is because he's trying to define what domestic um, what CDV means, what Children of Domestic Violence means, and what he wants to do is he wants to get a million people who are excited about sharing their story yeah. publicly. Yeah, you so really to have, have to get naked with that, yeah. You really have to get naked. That's not a financial transaction. That that is a naked thing that you got to do, yeah. right? So, you, again, you have to look at what currencies yeah. you're exchanging at that point yeah. and what your ask is. It, and most yeah. for most businesses, step eleven is where most of their clients are going to stop. This is your your primary product or service yeah. that you're selling, yeah. and most clients will engage there and they'll stop there. Yeah. Step twelve then is sex. This is this is where your top clients go. This is how they engage with you at the deepest possible level, whatever that means. It's more time, more energy, more information. Um, it, it's really defining for you uh, yeah. and for your customer what is the proper amount of those currencies that are being exchanged. Right. Yeah, that's amazing. My thanks for breaking that down because even in this interview, it applies to this interview because the point of the interview is for you to leave a legacy, share your story, but people really hit home if someone gets personal, you know? And so that's the step 11 is someone getting personal. The audience can really relate to that. And so this really applies to Well, and to remember what I said so. about selling versus marketing. Selling yeah. is is in an intimate environment. Marketing is done in a non-intimate environment. True, true, yeah, the yeah. Best, the best marketing emulates intimacy. Yeah. So the, your viewers, are going to view this in a non-intimate way. But because you and I are having an intimate conversation, it emulates the intimacy. Now, it, it, someone isn't likely to watch this and say, I'm gonna put $95,000 to work with, with Michael. I don't expect that. But my hope is that they're willing to go to promotebook.com and read the site, or they go to Beneath the Cover, and they read a blog post, or they right. download they a white paper. They check it out, right? My, that's my expectation, whereas most thought leaders and business owners expect to go on a show like this and expect someone to, to buy their book or to hire them or to do something bigger. And that's not likely going to happen. It can, but it's not highly probable. So when you're building out a thought leadership business uh, or an information uh, marketing-based business, you have to know what those 12 steps of intimacy are so that, you, so that you're not a douchebag um, pickup artist. Right. And that's what most direct marketers are. They're douchebag pickup artists. Yeah. Michael, this has been 
it's just extremely valuable. Um, you know, people we mentioned the last one, they can check out Promote a Book, right? Um, they can check you out there. They can check out uh, BeneathTheCover.com as well. And if they want more on, on Pendulum, they can go to PendulumInAction.com. Um, I'm happy to give away to them the Pendulum in Action Fundamentals, which is the Pendulum presentation, a training on the 12 Steps of Intimacy, a training on Persona Architecture. If they go to PendulumGift.com. Nice. Um, we don't really sell that for one, uh, one forty-seven. PendulumGift.com. And, and transparently, why am I a, why am I willing to do that? Because for me, I value relationship. And if someone's willing to spend the time to read a blog post or read a white paper or go through right. my training, it means that they're more likely to want to, assuming that there's an alignment of values and perspectives, that they're going to want to work with us. So it, it's very easy for me to be able to, to make those things available. Yeah. Um, and it's why we're not doing... And if you buy now, I'll give you a set of Ginsu knives. Like, the, the, like, <laughs> Which I did actually interview uh, Ron Popeil, so. <laughs> That's funny. But, but yeah. no, that worked really well in a, in a me cycle. It was a beautiful thing. It worked perfectly right. in that cycle. And now we all laugh about it. Because <laughs> it's, it's quaint and funny. So, Michael, where do we leave people now? Um, they should check out the website. How should we wrap things up? What uh, were the final words? on the 12 steps of intimacy and everything else we talked about? Well, again, I'm going to go back to, to what I said, uh, I think, in the, in the last interview. Roy Williams told me when we were walking to York back in 2003, he said, the winners and losers in life are determined when the teams are picked. Right. There are two teams that are essential to your success. The first are the team of people who pick you to be on their team, and the second are the people who you pick to be on your team. That's where success comes from. So yeah. be careful in the relationships that you build and note that the 12 steps of intimacy is the process by which you'll help other people to pick you to be on their team. Yeah. With that, I hope you don't die from a tornado or your house stays safe. <laughs> Me too. Thank you so much, Michael, again. I appreciate it. No problem. Bye. What I got it resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand